So it's good to be here. It is always good to be here. Thank you. After Moses very carefully reiterated all of the sanctions of blessings and cursings that would come upon Israel if they obeyed or if they disobeyed, he then segues into chapter 30, chapter 30 of Deuteronomy, the first 10 verses. By inspiration of God, the prophet of Israel, the lawgiver Moses, writes this. And it shall come to pass, when all these things are come upon thee, the blessing and the curse which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind among the nations, whither the Lord thy God hath driven thee, and shall return unto the Lord thy God, and shall obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day, thou and thy children, with all thine heart, with all thy soul, that then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee and will return and gather thee from all the nations whither the Lord thy God hath scattered thee. If any of thine be driven out unto the outmost parts of heaven, from thence will the Lord thy God gather thee and from thence will he fetch thee. And the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed and thou shalt possess it and he will do thee good and multiply thee above thy fathers. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and thy heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live. And the Lord thy God will put all these curses upon thine enemies and on them that hate thee which persecuted thee. And thou shalt return and obey the voice of the Lord and do all his commandments, which I command thee this day. And the Lord thy God will make thee plenteous in every work of thine hand, in the fruit of thy body, in the fruit of thy cattle, and in the fruit of thy land, for good. For the Lord will again rejoice over thee for good, as he rejoiced over thy fathers, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to keep his commandments and his statutes which are written in this book of the law. And if thou turn unto the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul. In Matthew 3, we read in the first two verses, In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Thus far as the reading of God's most holy, inerrant, and finally authoritative word, the grass withers, the flower thereof fades away, but the word of our God stands forever, and by his holy word is the gospel presented unto us again this day in its completeness and totality. Now after a series of warnings and a series of commandments concerning the various covenant sanctions for obedience and rebellion, Moses again, for even the third time, perhaps even the way you count it, maybe even the fourth time, he returns to those sanctions which he sets forth in, in Deuteronomy 27 and Deuteronomy 28 when he paraded before Israel all of the sanctions of obedience and then all of the sanctions, all of the consequences of disobedience. But this time, in chapter 30, he adds a caveat, a caveat of conditional mercy, almost as if Moses anticipated that Israel, with all of the miracles and all of the glory that they saw in the wilderness, almost as if Moses at this point anticipated that Israel would apostatize, that first generation would apostatize from the clear commandments of God. And he warns this next generation not to do what their fathers had done. And he tells them, 
that it will come to pass when all these things have come upon them, the blessing and the cursing which he set before them, and when they call these things to mind among the nations, whether the Lord had the God, God the Lord had driven them, and shall return unto the Lord their God, and obey his voice according to all that he commanded thee, that he would turn to them. But God is in fact telling them, in effect, is telling Israel that he is going to use the stipulations of Deuteronomy 28 and Leviticus 26. And just let me say this as a footnote. If you want to understand why we are where we are in our cultural conflict, you must read Deuteronomy chapter 28 and, Deuteronomy 20, and, and Leviticus 26. But also, you must also read Deuteronomy 27 where God had Israel publicly declare their obedience before the Lord their God. And yet, with all that public decora declaration, with all that the professions of faith, with all the miracles, they still fell away. And Moses anticipated this. And now he's using for this new generation the stipulations of Deuteronomy 28, Leviticus 26, the blessings and the cursings, but particularly the cursings, in order to bring back Israel into covenant obedience. And as a result, and as a response, to Israel's rebellion, God here promises. You know, we all like the promises that God will bless us, God will love us, God will do this and God will do that. And those promises are glorious. But there's also the promises of curses when we are disobedient. That's the part we don't like. I never saw a little book in the grocery store that said, the promises of God's cursings. <laughs> Only the promises of God's blessings to mothers, to fathers, to children, to babies. And, we need a book of the promises of God's cursings. And that's what Moses did for Israel. He said, these are the promises of God if you disobey. And God is faithful to his promise, whether it's a positive or a negative. He is faithful because he cannot deny his own word. So as a response to Israel's rebellion, God promises to bring these curses upon Israel, the curses of these, these books, in order to chastise them. But he's chastising them as a loving mercy so that Israel would wake up, that they would finally return to him and become the mature and consistent obedient people that God had called them to be. The key word here is consistency. Not ebbs and flows, but consistency. Now notice how God works in the affairs of men and nations. In direct response to rebellion, God brings these curses of Deuteronomy upon a nation so that they will, notice what God says, call to mind, that is, call to mind what these curses really mean. You'll call them to mind while you're among the nations where the Lord had sent you. In other words, I'm giving you these curses so that you would remember where you have fallen from. And by this dramatic reminder of curses, God was seeking in his ultimate mercy to wake up the people so that they would reflect upon their covenant disobedience. This was a dramatic reminder. These negative sanctions were God's tool for bringing back Israel into conformity to his covenant law. These were not happy sermons. If you want happy sermons, you shouldn't be in this church. You should be somewhere in the evangelical community, where they, the mega church, where they preach happy sermons. This was not a happy sermon. In fact, much of Deuteronomy was not a happy book. It was the totality of, of what had happened throughout the wilderness. Notice what Moses says. Because of the sanctions that you are to remember when you finally wake up, and shall return by that sanction unto the Lord thy God, and shall obey his voice according to all, key word here, all that I command thee this day. So by this act of a direct providential orchestrated chastisement, God calls Israel to repentance. But God was not interested in just any kind of divine acknowledgement by Israel. God wasn't interested that they would say, Oh yes, God, you are great. Oh God, you are good. Oh, we love you, Jesus. 
the repentance that God was calling Israel to, the repentance that God commanded Israel to, and the only kind that would satisfy the divine creator of the universe was a very precise repentance. Note first the kind of repentance that God commands Israel. With all thine heart and with all thy soul. Notice the comprehensiveness, the totality, the sincerity of the kind of the repentance that God is calling Israel to. Very specific. He just didn't say, as John the Baptist said, repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Because what John the Baptist was doing, he was pointing back to the kind of repentance that Israel needed to undertake. So that if Israel turned back to the Lord, it had to be a sincere turning, a total, a real repentance, a deep experiential, experimental sorrowing. It had to be a systemic response to this call. A systematic repentance which would be applicable to every area and element of the social order. It had to come from the heart out of a desire to please God and keep his commandments. But it had to be qualified. It had to be qualified by a renewed lifestyle. Not only a renewed worldview that precipitates the lifestyle but then a renewed lifestyle, a renewed direction, and a renewed purpose. A renewed purpose. A renewed goal. The totality of a renewed life. The great Puritan Thomas Watson explains, he says, the two great graces essential to a saint in this life are faith and repentance. These are the two wings by which he flies to heaven. Repentance is never out of season. It is of as frequent use as the artificer's tool or a soldier's weapon. Worldly tears fall to the earth, but godly tears are kept in a bottle, end quote. But God not only wanted sincere repentance, he wanted total repentance. The repentance sought by God was not to be compartmentalized. It had to be comprehensive. You know, sometimes we repent of the, the, the public sins, our private sins between our wives, our husbands, within our family, maybe within the church. But then we've got them secret sins. The ones that we hide in the closet from everyone, even even our most intimate companions, those are the sins that need to be rooted out. That is what it means to have total repentance. It could not be compartmentalized. It had to be comprehensive. Every facet of life, every institution of society had to repent and come under the oversight of God to the obedience of His law, His covenant. Israel not only had to mortify personal sins, and sins within their families, they had to tackle national sins as well. Whether they were sins against the preborn, education, the economy, domestic, international relations, immigration, ecological sins, juridical, uh, legislative sins, whatever you can, you can see in the community, in the nation, in the elements of civilization, they had to all be conformed to the Word of God. There was nothing that should be left out. Otherwise, it could not be a total repentance. And therefore, God would not accept it as any repentance. Whatever was rebellious within the culture, Israel was being called to repent of it and ultimately reconstruct that culture, confronting the culture. Remember, this new generation is about to enter Canaan. Canaan. Canaan filled with all kinds of wickedness. Now, sometimes we can't imagine what Canaan was like. Well, I have news for you. You're living in Canaan. You can't even imagine what is coming. You think this is bad. This is coming even more so because the church has failed in her commission. I was in Canada just last week and talking with ministers there, elders and pastors. And it was brought up that the church from one of my, uh, one of my uh, companions made sure that I didn't forget to tell those ministers that 
because of the church's silence, the culture is the way it is. And the way he put it, and the way I usually put it, is the culture is the report card of the church. As the church goes, so goes the nation. Watson again explains, he says, besides our own personal miscarriages, the deplorable condition of the land calls for a combination of tears. Now you think about Watson just for a moment. We, we idolize the Puritan era. Well, Watson and the Puritans, these were men of, of renown. These were men of faith. These were men of repentance. They knew that their own repentance was so feeble that they used to say, our repentance needs repenting of. It was never good enough. And yet, this man is speaking of his time in his century of the deplorable state of affairs. And he says that the land calls for a combination of tears. Have we not lost much of our pristine fame among the provinces where God made the sheaves of other nations do obeisance to our own sheaf? But has not our glory fled away as a bird? He might as well be talking about us. He continues, and what severe dispensations are yet behind, we cannot tell. Our black and hideous vapors having ascended, we may fear loud claps of thunder should follow. And will not all this bring us to our senses and excite us in a spirit of humiliation? Shall we sleep on the top of the mast when the winds are blowing from all the quarters of heaven? Oh, let not the apple of our eyes cease. End quote. He believed that a legion of destructive curses awaited the nation. That's what God was telling Israel, that if they disobeyed the covenant sanctions, that a legion of destructive curses awaited them if she went apostate. And that's what awaits every nation when they forget the God of their protection and blessing. So if you want to know where we are in our day, you read Deuteronomy 28, Leviticus 26. However, in Deuteronomy 30, and at the end of Leviticus 26, Moses tells Israel, not so much if they fall into disarray and apostasy, but when they fall into apostasy, when they fall into that apostate situation, there is a way back. There is a way back through repentance. I remember many, many years ago, Oh my, I hate to say it, but 30 years ago, I, I wanted to make a few t-shirts for myself, just for myself, one t-shirt for my, and, and one of the t-shirts, I wanted a picture of Thomas Watson, I love Thomas Watson, great Puritan, if you haven't read Thomas Ro Watson, uh, you, you really don't know what Christianity is really all about, but uh, actually, I had a picture of him on this t-shirt, but I used the book that some of these quotes have come from, The Doctrine of Repentance, and the young man who was doing the t-shirt work said, the doctrine of repentance. What does repentance mean? What does that mean? And my heart sank. And yet some in the Church of Jesus Christ today, knowingly or unknowingly, are asking that same question. What is exactly repentance and how does it come about? So Moses is telling Israel, there is hope. And that hope comes through repentance, but that repentance has to be on God's terms, not our terms. The written sanctions of the covenant were to be used as a reminder of where Israel had gone wrong so that they could repent in specific terms and turn from their specific sins personally within the family and within the nation. And it shall come to pass when all these things are come upon thee, the blessing and the curse which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind among the nations. Remember what I'm telling you is happening and why it's happening so that you may repent of them specifically. So God had given these sanctions in anticipation that Israel would fall away and giving them a way back. And this was a great mercy. The sanctions were to act as reminders, way marks, telling Israel when they had strayed and when they had not strayed. They could know beyond any doubt, any shadow of a doubt, where they stood with God by the explicit providence which he had orchestrated to befall them. 
So God here does not simply command repentance, but he gives Israel and the world at large incentives to repent. Think about Deuteronomy 28, Leviticus 26 as incentives to repent. In fact, these judgments act as incentives and invitations to seek the Lord with all thine heart, with all thy mind, with all thy soul. Think of it as a chastisement. You know, when you chastise your child, it's an incentive to obey. The greater the rebellion, the greater the chastisement, the greater the incentive, and the greater the invitation. Obey mommy, obey daddy. So God is giving these providential curses, pouring them upon the nation so that they would be incentivized to repent. And in Israel's case, certainly they would be blessed if they turned and repented. But God promised more than just that. The repentance would not only restore the repenting generation to God's favor, it would go beyond to the next generation upon Israel's posterity. You see, the future was being weighed in the balance. Israel's legacy was in question as a result of rebellion, as is America's today. Israel's children and grandchildren were now in the crosshairs of God's wrath if the fathers fail to repent. They were, on the brink, uh, they were on the brink of total annihilation generationally. Or they were on the brink of a glorious restoration, depending upon their response to the chastisements. The consequence of Israel's disobedience would be systemic and it would be generational. Likewise, the consequence of Israel's obedience would be systemic and generational. Now the situation and consequences of God's wrath would carry out through the lifetime of the next generation and then they would have to deal with, they would have to deal with the situations that their father had left them. And we hear this today, over and over with the national debt that the payments will be thrust upon the next generation, the can is kicked down the road, even the barbarians understand that generational consequence of disobedience and, 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 and wickedness. So even the heathen understand that there's a generational consequence to every policy and practice, whether it be good or whether it be evil. But if Israel sincerely repented, they could be assured by the promise of the Almighty that God would bless their children. And we read of this in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, 14. And you know the passage well. You know the verse well. If my people, my people, the professing Christians, not the heathen, we're not waiting for them to repent. They will not repent. They don't know what repentance is. They don't know how to repent. They don't know God. They cannot repent. God will not hear their prayers. But if my people, you, me, those who call upon the name of the Lord, if my people repent, my people, which are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. That's all about repentance. Then, notice, if you do this, then I will do that. That is conditional. Now we talk about unconditional grace and reformed faith. Yeah, well, grace is unconditional. But God is a conditional God in that he says, you obey, I will bless you, you disobey, you disobey, and you will bear the consequences. It's just the way it is. We don't like to think of it that way. We think God loves us. Jesus loves us. Not indiscriminately and not in a perverse fashion. Just like you love your child, but you will be certain to when they disobey, to train them to obey, even if it means spankings and all kinds of negative chastisements. It's just the way God has structured the world. That's the apparatus of, of the world. Now, if this repentance would happen, if the people would turn, the situation that the next generation was born into would be well. That was the promise. Notice, verse 2 of Deuteronomy 20, And shall return unto the Lord thy God, and shall obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day, thou and thy children, with all thine heart and with all thy soul. This is the generational promise of God. God thinks in generational terms. That's what we need to do too. We need to think in generational terms, not our grandchildren only, but the children that will come in ten generations. 
Are you planning for 10 generations? Don't you just want to get out and smack somebody when you read on their bumper, I'm spending my children's inheritance? Don't you want to just get out there and just rip them to shreds with your words? But all of this promise of blessing depended upon Israel's willingness to repent. Consider the grace and duty of repentance because it is both a grace and a duty. Repentance is both a grace and a duty and yet the emphasis upon the Christian is her or his duty to repent. Watson puts it this way, repentance is a great duty incumbent upon Christians solemnly to repent and turn unto God. It is a grace required under the gospel. Some think that repentance is legal. But the first sermon that Christ preached, indeed, the first word of his sermon was repent. Repentance is a pure gospel grace, end quote. So what Israel failed to understand was that there was a great distinction between sincere and godly repentance and a counterfeit worldly repentance. Israel's first need was to be aware of her sins before she could even repent. You see, that's the key. You have to be aware of your sins. Oh, of course, we look out there and we, we see that, yes, there are so many horrible things and the nation needs to repent, but, but we need to have a sight of sin. And that's the first component, the first ingredients of repentance. Sight of sin. You can't repent of something you don't know about. You can't repent of something you can't see. The difficulty of this is that part of God's judgment, if you very carefully, Deuteronomy 28, is that part of God's judgment is a blindness. God blinds the wicked to the very sins that are bringing about his wretched condition, the condemnation that God has prescribed. This is a catch-22 situation since Israel needed to be aware of her sins. She needed to have sight of her sins. And yet, because of her sins, she was blinded in her sin. And that's what's so scary about God's wrath. The more we continue without repenting, the more we are blinded to our sins. This is why repentance is a necessary commandment daily. Oh God, have mercy upon me that I would see my sins, my conscience would not be seared, would not be hardened, and I might repent speedily, lest I be blinded in my own sin. You see, this condemnation not only brings hardship on the sinner, it also blinds the sinner to his sin until he's brought under the dregs of humiliation before God opens his eyes, if God opens his eyes if it's his will to open his eyes. The reality in and of itself was encouragement for Israel not to depart from the living God in the first place. To be sensitive to their sins and pray always, oh God, save me from my presumptuousness, my pride, my arrogance. But sight of sin is not enough, is it? Even Pharaoh had a sight of sin. In fact, Pharaoh the wicked Pharaoh confessed that he had sinned twice. At, once after the hail and once after the locust. After the locust, notice what he says in Exodus 10, 16. This is Pharaoh. I have sinned against Yahweh Elohim. Even knew his name. Calls him by the name Yahweh. And against you. Wow. He, he confesses that he has sinned against the Lord their God and against Israel. After the hail, he even goes a step further by even declaring God as a righteous God and himself, along with his people, is wicked. Isn't that incredible? Exodus 9.27 And Pharaoh sent and called for Moses and Aaron and said unto them, I have sinned this time. The Lord is righteous, and I and my people are wicked. He saw it. Plain, plain as day, clear as, clear as day. Yet for all that he did not repent. God destroyed him. So what other components of true repentance were lacking in Pharaoh? The second component, sight of sin and then sorrow for sin. Pharaoh was not sorry for his sin. He saw it, but he was not sorry for it. He was only sorry that his sin brought about the locusts, the blood in the water, the hail, the fire, all of those things. He was sorry for the consequences. He was sorry that God had brought about upon Israel his heavy hand of judgment, but he was 
not sorry because he was a sinner. Likewise, Esau, he too was not really sorry for his sin. His tears were worldly. They were not sincere. And we read that in Hebrews 12, 14 and following. He was not sincere. Esau was not only sorrowful for what he had lost, his birthright because of his stupidity and arrogance. He was not sorry because he had violated the law of the covenant and the honor of God. He was only sorry because he was no longer considered the firstborn. He was sorry for what he had lost, not because he was a sinner, because he was ignorant. Watson says this, Godly sorrow is, godly sorrow is inward, genuine, true, and sincere. But sight and sorrow, not enough. The third component, confession. The only type of confession is that which is sincere and that which is voluntary. It is usually a confession that comes without first being caught. It comes as a result of God's word, convicting the conscience. David confessed, not so much because his sin was made public, but because Nathan's words convicted him in an allegory that he was a sinful man. However, there are circumstances when genuine confession does come by way of being caught. Sometimes we're caught. And then we realize how much we are in trouble with God. But even then, after being caught, confession must be voluntary. Not extracted, not coaxed. And the motive must be pure, mixed with faith and godly sorrow. True confession also is something we don't like to do because it's very uncomfortable. It particularizes our sin. Start listing your sins. Take a week off because you'll need it. If you're sincere. Sins of commission, that will be a long list. Sins of omission, a whole lot longer. True confession also particularizes sin. It expounds your sin in detail before God. It is not vague as to hide ugliness. It is explicit. Too often, men to, too often men seek to justify sin with their confessions. Oh God, I'm a sinner, but I had a bad night. I was dancing. I was making merry with my friends, or a lot of stress at work, or whatever. See, many confessions are used just to make an excuse why they have this, done this thing or that thing, and as if an outside force, my favorite, Oh, devil's after me this week. Real messed up this week. Oh, gosh, it's all nonsense. Nonsense. It's in you. Your sin is in you. It's part of your nature. It's your default response to situations that come against you at a certain time, most times when you're weak. But make no mistake about it. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, because no man is tempted of God, but he's tempted when he is drawn away from his own lusts, by his own lusts. Watson explains, he says, a true penitent confesses sin in the fountain. He acknowledges the pollution of his nature. The sin of our nature is not only a deprivation of good, but an infusion of evil. It is like canker to iron or stain to scarlet. David acknowledges his birth sin in Psalm 51.5 when he says, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. We are ready to charge many of our first sins to Satan's temptations, but this sin of our nature is wholly from ourselves. We cannot shift it off to Satan. We have a root within that bears gall and wormwood. Our nature is an abyss and a seminary of evil from whence come those scandals that infest the world. It is the depravity of nature which poisons our holy things. It is this which brings on God's judgment. Oh, confess sin in the fountain. In R.J. Rushdoony's work on repentance in his book, A Cure of Souls, he comments thus, Confession without repentance is no confession at all. Repentance means literally a reversal of direction of life. It is a modern heresy.
to equate repentance with a verbal statement, end quote. The fourth component or ingredient, sight, sorrow, confession, shame. Shame is a s sorrowful thing and a shameful thing. Sin is a shameful, shameful thing because it defiles the whole man. And if not dealt with, it defiles the family, defiles the church, the community, the nation. And we have a testimony of providence, of history. It defiles the entire world. Our entire world is a shameful mess. Sin is a shameful thing. So God calls his people to be sensitive to sin so that they may be ashamed of it and ashamed for it. God commands e Ezekiel. Notice what he says. When he comments on this aspect of the shamefulness of sin, he says in Ezekiel 43, verse 10, Thou son of man, show the house to the house of Israel so that they may be ashamed of their iniquities. What is happening in America and the church? They're no longer ashamed of anything. There's no more shame. They're not ashamed. This is civil rights. This is w w because we want to be fair to everyone. And we want to put evil for good and good for evil. There's no shame here. They're not ashamed. Because they're hardened in their sins. Now we see God's grace bringing a man to the point of shame in the parable of the prodigal son. And when he came to himself, he realized this is a shameful life that I'm living. I'm living a prodigal life, a life of, of, of debauchery and libertinism. But when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thine hired servants. He was ashamed. Later in Israel's history, they became so hardened that they were now immune to shame. I think we're pretty much there. Jeremiah 6.15. Were they ashamed? God is asking a rhetorical question. Were they ashamed when they had committed abominations? Nay. They were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore, they shall fall among them that fall. At the time that I visit them, they shall be cast down, saith Yahweh. That is scary language. Do you believe God is true to his word and his promises? That's just strike fear into your heart. And if it does not, you need to pray that you are more sensitive to his word. After Adam and Eve sinned, they found themselves naked. And the scripture says that they were ashamed. Because sin makes a sensitive conscience ashamed. But when the conscience is seared, there can be no shame for sin or any repentance because of it. So when Adam and Eve saw that they were naked, they were ashamed. And yet, instead of seeking forgiveness, like so many others in the church of Jesus Christ, they sought to cover their shame by their own work or by their own justification. Instead of repenting and confessing and begging God for mercy, this self-atonement covering, as I call it, appeased their conscience just enough to keep them from an honest confession before God for their sin. And so shame in and of itself is not enough. The fifth component of repentance is hatred. Hatred of sin. Part of God's grace is granting us a hatred for our sins. Not only for the sins out there. That's easy. In fact, that shifts the blame out there. Oh, look how wonderful I am. I'm the Pharisee and look at them. How horrible they are in Congress. Ooh. No, no, no. Hatred of your sin first and foremost. A loathing of both what we are by nature and what comes from that sinful nature. The new birth manifests itself by causing us to hate the sin that is in ourselves. Watson says that we are never more precious in God's sight than when we are lepers in our own. Notice how a loathing of sin is the result of the new birth. Notice the result of true confession, of true repentance, and true born-again regeneration is a loathing of sin in yourself. Let me say it again. If you're asking the question, am I a child of God? 
one of the way marks, one of the, the identifying factors of the new birth is that you loathe your own sin. Notice here Ezekiel 36, beginning in 24. God says, For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you an heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and ye shall keep my judgments and do them and ye shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and ye shall be my people, and I will be your God. I will also save you from all your uncleannesses, and I will call for the corn, and will increase it, and lay no famine upon you. And I will multiply the fruit of the tree, and the increase of the field, that ye shall receive no more reproach of famine among the heathen. Then shall ye remember your own evil ways, and your doings that were not good, and shall loathe yourselves in your own sight, for your iniquities and for your abominations. Now a man can say that he loves God, but if he hates not the evil that resides in himself and that evil which is afoot in the world, he's a liar and the truth is not in him. A man must hate sin, whether it's in himself or in the world, but he must hate sin in himself first before he can rightly claim that he hates the sin in the world and in others in particular. And this is why Jesus warns in Matthew 7, 2 and following, For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye mate, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but castest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote that is in thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye, thou hypocrite! First cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Watson again observes this. Hatred is universal in respect of the object. He who hates one sin must hate all sin. David says, I hate every false way in Psalm 119, 104. Hypocrites will hate some sins which are marring their credit, but a true convert hates all sins gainful sins, complexion sins, the very stirrings of corruption. Watson also, Watson also yokes man's willfulness with his sinfulness. You think that just sin happens? Sin doesn't just happen. You make it happen. Even though you don't think you do when you get angry. You ever, you ever, you ever think about this? Let's say you're having a rip-roaring argument with your wife or your husband and you're screaming. I hope that's not your case. I, I know that's never happened here. And you're really upset or you're really angry and the phone rings and you're just in the middle of rah, and you answer the phone, hello. You willed one and the other. You remember that next time. Watson says this, Hatred must be universal in respect of the faculties. That is, there must be a dislike of sin not only in the judgment, but in the will and affections. In true repentance, the hatred of sin is in all the faculties, not only in the intellectual part, but chiefly in the will. When Paul stated, what I hate that I do, Paul was not free from sin, yet his will was against it. To love sin shows that the will is in sin. And the more of the will there is in sin, the greater the sin. End quote. This is where the rubber meets the road. Sin must not only be despised, but it must be dispensed with. And true reformation hangs on this aspect of repentance. One can only grow in grace if one mortifies and turns from evil practices. But Watson calls the Christian to go one step further than a simple turning from sin. He calls the Christian to turn from sin with the whole heart, mind, and will. And that is what Moses was getting at. Three times in this 10 verse segment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Totally, comprehensively. True repentance engages the whole fabric of man. 
his whole being. Repentance involves the putting off of evil and the replacing of evil with good. Moses is telling Israel that God has a way back for them whenever they fall from grace, and that way is repentance. So the final component is turning from sin. Turning from sin, sight, sorrow, confession, shame, hatred, and then turning. Putting it away, totally, in the will and the affections. Now for a moment, let's consider the outcome of God's grace and Israel's repentance. By God's mercy, Israel would recognize that they had sinned by the judgments befalling them. That's what we need to understand. We must recognize that the judgments befalling our church and our nation are God's ways of calling us back to sobriety and action, confrontation. No, we could talk and talk and talk and talk and we say we walk the walk. We walk the walk in the fall world, world ghetto church maybe or in our, in our little homes and in our jobs. But where's the confronting of culture in the areas of life outside the church? Until used to say that God confronts culture everywhere. If he doesn't confront culture everywhere, then he confronts culture nowhere. Because God is God, all-inclusive, and he is the creator of the world. Secondly, Israel would then return to the Lord and obey his voice consistently, completely, lovingly, wholly. Next in God's compassion, God would then liberate Israel. And notice, he would reverse the curse of Israel's scattering by gathering them once again as a nation. The Lord thy God. Verse 3, will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee and will turn and gather thee from all the nations whither the Lord thy God hath scattered thee. God also goes one step further by stating that no matter where the Hebrew people are, he'll find them and gather them into the field. If any of thy people be driven out into the utmost parts of heaven, from thence will the Lord thy God gather thee and from thence will he fetch thee. This is what Isaiah was referring to when he spoke of the gathering which Jesus would do through the gospel. Isaiah 11:12, Isaiah 40:11, Isaiah 43:5. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. He shall flee, feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arms and carry them in his bosom. He shall gently lead those that are with young. Fear not, for I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east and gather thee from the west. This was the galvanizing of God's people. I want to know where that is today. Where is the galvanizing of God's people today? Where is the gathering that Jesus promised? Yes, he has gathered his people, but all of a sudden now, because we have disobeyed, he's scattering us. The Christian church has no continuity. We will split, we'll split churches over head coverings. Or because the carpet is green and not blue. Or because we have a font or we have a baptismal. We'll look for every excuse not to be responsible for the culture. Jesus picks up upon Isaiah's words in his eschatological parable in Matthew 24, 31. And he shall send his angels, his messengers, that's you, with the great sound of a trumpet. And that's the warfare call. That's the gathering call whenever Moses and Aaron had the judges blow the trumpet. It was for gathering, either for warfare or for the assembly of the worship. With the great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. This is the gathering and the galvanizing of the Israel of God, all those that are children of God. John tells us that the children of God are not those which are only Abraham's seed according to the promise, but those who are the children of the regeneration. That's what counts. The next promise God gives is land possession and dominion through generational multiplication. Even greater than the Father's generational conquests. And the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed, and thou shalt possess it. Notice, they will be the rulers, they will be the leaders, and he will do thee good and multiply thee above thy fathers. Then God goes even one step further in his covenant oath, his promise. He guarantees the regeneration to the obedient generation and the generation of their children. And this is just amazing. 
and the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed. He's actually saying he's going to save those children from the obedient parent. To love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, that thou mayest live. This is an incredible promise. And this is what God means by blessing a people beyond what they are able to comprehend. But there's even more. The curses that were originally meant for rebellious Israel, and you can read them in 28 and 26, Deuteronomy and Leviticus. God's now going to put those curses upon the enemy. He's going to flip it around and put those same curses upon the enemy. And the Lord thy God will put all these curses upon thine enemies. In other words, he will vindicate himself once his people repent. Once his people repent, he will vindicate himself upon the enemies by, by putting all of those curses, not upon his people to chastise them, but upon the enemies of God. This would also provide further incentive to continue in obedience. You know, we keep saying, you know, we talk about imprecatory psalms, imprecatory psalms. You want the best imprecatory psalm? Oh God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. Because the repentance of God's people will turn all of those imprecations, those, those curses, those imprecatory psalms, right on the head of the wicked. That's what we need. Because it's frivolous to pray or sing imprecatory psalms against the wicked of the world if we remain in disobedience. Because God might just turn around those imprecatory psalms and put them on our heads. Note how the curses are reversed and Israel is restored to what the blessings of Deuteronomy had promised. <coughs> and the Lord thy God will make thee plenteous in every work of thine hand in the fruit of thy body and in the fruit of thy cattle and in the fruit of thy land for good. So the Lord will again rejoice over thee for good as he rejoiced over thy fathers. You know, if you read carefully Deuteronomy 28, there's a portion there which is very scary. <coughs> Because over the rebellious people, God rejoices over them to do them evil. This destruction against the enemies of God would provide peace and safety along with the assurance of dominion since the enemies of God and of Israel would be destroyed. Finally, all this was conditional. As with all of the promises of God, these two were conditional upon Israel's obedience. Notice Deuteronomy 30, verse 10. The first word should be in bold letters, red, big, underlined, italicized. If. If. If thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to keep his commandments and his statutes which are written in this book of the law, and if thou turn unto the Lord thy God, note, with, all thine heart and with all thy soul. And so in the midst of God's declared covenant stipulations, even in the midst of terrible circumstances, he holds out hope to his people for restoration should his people fall into the abyss of their old Adamic nature and forget the God of nations. But only if they repent. My friends, my brethren, May God be well pleased to grant to us in our day sincere, complete, and total repentance in such times as we live in today. And this we shall do, God helping us, unto the praise of the glory of his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, God help us. God help us not to be fearful. God help us not to be lazy or slothful. God help us to be bold as lions tenacious, resolved in the work which you have called us to. And we're all doing different things on the wall. But together, together, we pray that thou would empower us to do a good work, a mighty work, and to bring many along in that work. Call upon them to, to put down their, their, their plowshares and pick up the spears so that one day we could put down the spears and pick up plowshares. Oh God, our Father. We bless thee, we thank thee. We know that thou art doing a great work today for all things are done for good. And may it be that the wretchedness of our nation might be for the restoration of thy people 
as they one by one awake to the challenge and the confrontation that that was placed in their lives, not only for themselves in this day, but for all days following to the generations next and the next one to 10,000 generations for as many as the Lord thy God, our God, will call and therefore our Father, we have hope. We pray, our Father, thy blessing upon each and every one of these families here today and all of thy people who call upon the name of the Lord and have not kissed the image of Baal. Do not, do not eat at Jezebel's table, but reprove the unrighteousness of wicked men and nations. Father in heaven, we bless thee. We thank thee. We ask these things in the name of our Christ, our Jesus, our prophet, priest, and king. Amen and amen.